I'm Hillary Hendershot, your host, and this is Profit Boss Radio, episode 110. Profit Boss Radio is your weekly wealth mastermind. Profit Boss is also a community and a movement for women who are ready to take control of their money, break the glass ceiling, and give ourselves permission to finally have enough. Want the secrets of wealth to be yours? This is the place. I'm Hillary Hendershot. I'm a certified financial planner running a leading advisory firm for women, and I'm sharing with you real stories from real life and real women who are making it happen. Forget Wall Street. Let's do this, ladies. Hey, Profit Boss Radio audience. I have with me today Alex Grodnick. I think, Alex, maybe you're the third or fourth man on Profit Boss Radio. Welcome. That's exciting. Yeah, lucky me. (laughs) Alex began his career as an analyst at JP Morgan Private Bank. After completing that program, he moved into investment banking at Houlihan Loki in their restructuring group. He went on to work at a pioneering digital media firm before getting his MBA from UCLA Anderson. So obviously, Alex is a credible, smart, academically successful guy. And he's held some of these roles that are, I think, very evocative or provocative for us on on Wall Street. And he is here to talk about why he actually chose a different path. And, you know, on this show, I talk, uh, I sort of rail against Wall Street. I don't rail against JP Morgan private bankers, but I rail against that, you know, we should do business with big institutions that don't care about being transparent and doing business the right way. And so I think Alex's life choices seem to be in line with what I would want for us in our financial lives. And, you know, I've chatted with him for several minutes on while we talked about what this interview would be like. And he just seems like a real stand up, classy, on the up and up guy. So I'm excited to hear from him about his journey and what he's up to now. Alex, welcome to Profit Boss Radio. Thanks, Hillary. And thank you for those kind words. Yeah. Well, you do seem like a good guy. (laughs) So you grew up in Park City, Utah. You love to ski and golf. Are you still in Park City, Utah? No, I live in Los Angeles now. I'd love to live in Park City. Unfortunately, not a lot of investment banking jobs there, which was, I don't do that anymore. But for the first 20 years of my life, I was while I never even met an investment banker, for mm-hmm. some reason, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. And Is that so right? Was, yeah. Kind of funny how that works. My parents say I was born with a briefcase. In my, <laughs> <laughs> I um, see you waiting for the bus with a leather rectangular briefcase in your hand. Yeah. <laughs> so I was just like hell bent on getting into investment banking. And so I went out to school on the East Coast and I got a job in private banking because it was the middle of the financial crisis in 2009 when I graduated and it was like oh, wow. impossible. To, I mean, I thought I was going to be working at Starbucks. So I was lucky, really fortunate to get a job at JP Morgan. Uh, and then I did that for a little while. That well, was like an analyst program. What do investment bankers actually do? Yeah. So investment banks really do two things. They help businesses buy and sell and acquire one another. That's called M&A, mergers and acquisitions. Uh, And then the other thing is they help companies raise money, so issue debt and equity. So let's say Apple wants to buy Google, uh, an investment bank, two, two sets of advisors, investment bankers and lawyers. The investment bankers are called financial advisors and lawyers are called whatever they're called. Uh, they'll get involved to help execute that transaction. Mm-hmm. And so M&A bankers are out there pitching companies and like hedge funds and private equity funds all day long saying, hey, you should buy this company or you should acquire that company. Because like, when that happens, that's when they get these you know $100 million fees that you hear about on Wall Street. The other side is companies need money in order to operate. And so they access the capital markets and they issue debt or equity. Equity is what you all know about as trading on the stock exchange. Uh, Debt is actually much, much bigger, but you just don't really see debt trading. It's much more on the institutional side. But investment banks do that too. They'll 
put together a little presentation saying, here's what we're selling, here's the equity, here's what you get. And they go out on these things called roadshows. You go around the world and you talk with institutional investors about a business, about the opportunity, and you do IPOs or secondary offerings. And so that's at the high level what investment banks do. Um, what investment banks hire people, they hire people right out of undergraduate uh, and then they hire people right out of MBA to be analysts at the undergraduate level and associates at the MBA or graduate level. And those people are at the bottom totem pole of these deal teams. Mm -hmm. And you're putting together financial models and presentations uh, until the wee hours of the night. Actually, investment banking is a ton about like just showing your face in the office. So when the partners are in the office, you know, from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., you're kind of just like on calls and I don't know, doing whatever, basically not doing that much. And then when the partners leave, that's when they start to think about what work that they want to happen overnight so that they can have a nice new product the next morning. So as he's heading out the office at 5.30 or so, you get, they'll stop by your desk and say, hey, Alex, I'd love, you know, to see a financial presentation like this and a model like that and, you know, don't don't spin your wheels or don't spend all night on this. That's just like what he says, but it's oh, very no, going to take really? all night long to do this. And so, yeah, usually work really doesn't start until five or six at night. You grab dinner and then you kind of get into it and you usually work till like I don't know, one, two, three in the morning on getting that next day of stuff together for, for them, to, for the process to kind of start all over. And, you know, so you work a lot, but these are, desirable jobs you know they pay people just out of undergrad six figures to do this mm -hmm. so on, a, on an hourly adjusted basis it's, it's not fabulous but you do learn a lot and you do get paid a lot so there's there's a lot to be said for it for starting your you're starting your job in investment banking well it's like any any role starting on me i have friends who are doctors and in their residency they basically make less than minimum wage on a per hour basis and then they do that for eight or 10 or 12 years, depending on how smart and how far they want to go. And then they make a half million or a million dollars a year after that. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, and lawyers know, too. Sure. So yeah, I mean, there's definitely something to be said for paying your dues early on. And they are paying you. You know, I live in LA. I have friends that started their careers off in the mail room of talent agencies. And there you work hard and they pay you nothing and you really get no skill set besides kind of understanding how Hollywood works and connections, at least in investment banking, you get a really, really valuable skill set of understanding companies and being able to build financial models and like quickly digest business models. Uh, and, and you do get paid for it. So mm -hmm. there it is, it is, uh, there's something to be said for that too. Okay. So you were in investment banking in between undergraduate and, and your MBA and then went back after your MBA. And then what happened? So, yeah, so I was working in banking and I actually went to go work. So the path out of banking is at the lower levels, no one stays there for long because you get, a, what I said, a really desirable skill set and you're sought after in the market. So most people go to what's called the buy side, mm -hmm. which is hedge funds and private equity funds. I forgot to mention earlier, Hillary, that investment banking is called the sell side because as I kind of described, they're selling securities. They're selling stocks and bonds and stuff to people. The people buying it, the hedge funds and private equity funds, that's the more desirable place for investment makers to go. You get paid a little bit more. You become the client who's hiring the investment bank. So you just have a little bit more clarity in, in your in your schedule. And you mm -hmm. still work long hours because you're still buying companies and it's still deal focused. And so if you're buying a company, you're still going to be working around the clock. Uh, so people go there and then people also go to companies to do what's called corporate development, where you're essentially doing investment banking type work inside of a company. So you're buying and selling companies, but for a specific company. Mm -hmm. So I went and did that for a digital media company. We bought websites and apps and we created the apps for the Kardashian sisters and uh, some kind of fun stuff like that. I thought I really wanted to be involved in entertainment. Mm -hmm. uh, I found out that I really didn't, but it was an interesting business. And But anyways, in investment banking, it's a very, very focused role. You know, as an analyst or associate, your role is super defined. Like they want you doing a very set skill and like, that's it. That's what you're going to be doing all day long, building presentations, financial models versus me. I was a super entrepreneurial person. I was like the lemonade stand kid, car wash kid growing up, like selling crap door to door. So for some reason, I don't know, like that was what I was saying at the beginning. I don't know why I wanted to do investment banking, but I just kind of did. So I went and did it. 
but it wasn't right for me. But I didn't know that at the time. I just knew that I didn't really like doing this and I was like okay at it. But I, when someone would tell me to do something, I would always have these like creative ideas about how, how it could be done in another way. And they hated that. The banks hated that. They so, didn't want you to be creative. <laughs> no. They wanted you to just think. And they're like, no, 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 Alex. Yeah. Don't don't think like that. Yeah. Think like this. We don't pay you to so, think. Right. So I knew it wasn't quite right. And then like I thought, oh, this digital media company, maybe it'll be a little less work. And I don't know. I like entertainment. And like maybe that's right. And that also wasn't right. But so I thought, okay, I'll go to business school to figure out what is right. Because I, I didn't know. And I, I still I wasn't able to put my finger on the fact that I need to be an entrepreneur yet. So fun. I went to business school. It's kind of like a selfish two years where you get to spend a bunch of money or take a bunch of debt, go have some crazy experiences, meet a bunch of people, figure out what is right for you. And, you know, business school is not really about the classroom learning. It's much more about experiences and meeting people and kind of figuring out who you are. But my most impactful moment for me, at least, happened inside of the classroom. I was taking one of these like leadership type classes and the professor had us write down a few times when we felt like we were being our most authentic self. And he defined that as feeling like you're really using all of your brain power and firing on all cylinders and you, know, you feel like alive. And so fine, I wrote down a few times when, when I felt like that. And afterwards, I was looking at that list and I was like, man, every one of these times, I'm doing something entrepreneurial. I'm starting a business. I'm selling you know ski tickets at the mountain I grew up at in, in Park City or um, uh, starting a taxi business at Sundance Film Festival. And it's like, that was the light bulb moment. It's, I was, wow. Up until that point, I had really been chasing these prestigious jobs and jobs that other people value and pay you lots of money. But it was never intrinsically what, what, I, what was right for me. And so that's when I said, okay, I need to stop trying to get these prestigious things which is up until that point in business school, I was still trying to get, uh, and I need to go be entrepreneur. Like this is clearly what is right. You know, my whole family is entrepreneurs, my dad, his dad, my mom, my mom's like everyone's, everyone starts businesses. Uh -huh. So that's what, that's what was inside of me. And that's when I realized, okay, entrepreneur time. But then it's like, okay, I don't know how to become an entrepreneur. That. <laughs> I, I, what now? I know, yeah. I know how to have a high powered job and get yelled at all day long. Like that's what I was, that's what I was good at. Um, so yeah, exactly what now, and it's just like anything else, it requires just practice and thought. And so I, that's when I started a little podcasting business and got into that. And that, is that what you me, did first? You uh, saw your first entrepreneurial official entrepreneurial endeavor was the podcast. Yeah. Right out of, so I was working at a venture capital fund, like kind of an interning at a, at a venture capital fund and I was driving all over Los Angeles. So I was listening to podcasts as I was driving and then we go have these like incredible meetings with really incredible technologists. And I thought, Hey, and in business school, you're just surrounded by so many incredible people that I thought, Hey, maybe I could, what I'm saying, get practice starting a business by starting a podcast. It's, I actually really like cold emailing CEOs and asking them to grab a coffee with me. I, I one of my internships was I worked at Warner brothers and I emailed the CEO and I said, can we grab coffee? And like, people were like, wow, how do you, how do you do that? And I thought, well, this is just, I don't know. I just don't even think about it. It's just what I do. And so I thought maybe I can do some, maybe there's, maybe there's something there. Uh, and it turned out there, there was a little something there. So I started this little podcast and, uh, business insider wrote like a little thing about it. And it's all of a sudden people started to listen to it. And it was really just me speaking with business leaders about their path how they got to where they are, the ups, the downs of their careers. I thought those were interesting things that I was interested in. And I bought a couple microphones and I thought maybe other people would be interested in that too. And it turns out some of them were. So you're, you're out of the gates. You're a, a hit as an entrepreneur. You, you know, <laughs> a, a, a hit if, if it's in terms of activity. It's not like I was making, really monetizing the podcast. So yeah, I was getting big interviews um, just because, a, it's super easy to email people when you have like a .edu email address. Right. No one says no to a student. And you know, now that I'm not a student anymore, I just have to send more emails because I think my hit rate's probably a little a little bit lower. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just start asking people, hey, you want to be on my podcast? And it's funny because lots of people want to talk about themselves, surprisingly. 
They sure do. All right. But you're also running a startup now on the side, not on the side, excuse me. The podcast is on the side and the startup is the thing. Am I right? Yeah, you're right. So I have a fintech company. We've built an app and it's kind of, it's like a peer to peer payments app. It helps large groups collect money. And so, yeah, we're running that. We're part of a, uh, fintech accelerator in los angeles and so we you know go work with all these other entrepreneurs and we're going after venture financing so we're trying to who's, take over the, who's we two other co-founders so i linked up with these guys getting closer to finishing up business school i was doing some like consulting work for a media company and the cfo of that company was leaving to start this payments company and we became friends and we just started talking about it. And, you know, it's not, I didn't, I didn't know. I thought I was going to graduate and do the podcast thing full time. And it just, this opportunity just came up and we just started talking and it sounded interesting. And so we just kind of started doing stuff. They were like, you know, they wanted my investment banking skill set. Basically, they said, you know, we need a kind of an operating model and maybe a little PowerPoint presentation to go pitch investors. And so we just, we didn't, I mean, we, we didn't even like, we weren't even talking about money. We weren't talking about stock. We were just, like, all right. So I just started building these things and we just kind of started talking with people. And it, I think that's, that's how like real opportunities kind of come up, you know, like you can go apply for jobs on LinkedIn and stuff like that. But life is so competitive that unless you're willing to go like, just, I mean, look at me, I did free work for, I don't know, months before we had anything formal in place. It's just, I was interested in it. And we just started, started kind of going. Like no one knew what, what was going to happen, but we just we just started doing. So yeah, the payments thing came up, and I said I'm still going to do some podcasting stuff, and I'm still going to do this. And yeah, that's it's been like a year now, and uh, I don't know. They're 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 both kind of moving forward. The startup, the one, the payments one is is takes up much much more of my time, but it's you know it's it's a real startup. Like we have incredible days and we have terrible days and we're trying to raise lots and lots of money to go take over the whole world and get everyone to use this product. Yeah. And so it, it's a very different kind of way of thinking about business versus the way that I usually thought about business was, oh, I can start a podcast for zero dollars or, you know, like very, very little dollars and then try to do something like that's, that's how I think about businesses, but it's been enlightening kind of to hang out with the CEO of this payments company. Cause he thinks about businesses like trying to take over the world and, you know, it's like not going to make money for a very, very, very long time. And so we need to raise outside funding to get it going. Uh -huh. So it's, 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 it's interesting. It's a different way of thinking about it. So you went from, and by the way, three things to say, now I have to organize in what order I'm going to say them. So, you know, you don't even realize it, but you reaching out to me in the way that you did was actually really inspiring for me. I mean, I feel like maybe I've sort of insulated myself from that creative experience entrepreneurial experience by, you know, I have a team who's supposed to book me on podcasts and I have a team who's supposed to book other people on my show. And I just sort of stand at home plate and swing at the balls, but you're like pitching, you're like on the pitcher's mound, <laughs> you know, and you reached out to me and I thought, look at him. That's that I miss doing that. Right. And so that, thank you for doing that. And that to circle back to what you were saying about, yeah, you can get on LinkedIn and look for a job, but that's something somebody else created. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with stepping into something someone else created. But if you really want to swing for the fences to continue with my baseball metaphor, you got to create, you got to get out there and talk to people. You have to create something that didn't exist before. Yeah. I really like that. I would say that the, you know, I've done uh, 50 episodes or something for my podcast. And one of the primary takeaways is that in your career early on or, or even later on, no one really has any clue what they're doing. You know, I talk with some just like immensely successful people. Yeah. And we talk about like that moment when like, like me, like I left banking and now I'm doing entrepreneurial stuff and I don't have the success story of, us crushing it yet but hopefully that's not too far off and then <laughs> and then I'll go on podcasts and talk about like how I did that and like what I was thinking but like look at me right now I'm in the moment and I don't have any I don't have any clue or like any grand plan for what I'm trying to do uh, I'm just every day I'm waking up I'm putting one foot in front of the other and I'm trying my hardest every day I mean you have to have goals and, and things like that but 
you just do. You just you just go. And that's what the most successful entrepreneurs or workers or whoever, that's what they do. They do. They go and they do their best in the moment. And then in the quiet moments at night, after you get home, you have a little recap with yourself and you say to yourself, self, next time, instead of doing that, I'll do that. And self, you did a great job on that, that, and that. And then you go do better the next day. And it's like incremental. <laughs> yeah. You know, I spoke with the guy who founded Google Voice and he didn't know anything about like telephony. He he was a lawyer and then he turned into a venture capitalist and then he like saw this struggling business and he got involved and they turned it around. And it's like he had no clue, but it, it just it just kind of happened for him because he worked hard and he put himself, you know, in the right place at the right time and he saw it and he just kind of went for it. I'm pleased to introduce to the Profit Boss Radio audience a wonderful sponsor, creditrepair.com. And if you've got anything but beaming pride about your credit score, I want you to give them a call. Creditrepair.com can help make sure that there's nothing on your credit report that shouldn't be there. I can tell you from personal experience, though, full disclosure, I didn't use creditrepair.com, but I can tell you credit repair works. It worked for me, and I now have a near perfect credit score. Visit their website at creditrepair.com or call 1 833 333 2282 today to learn more. Most financial advisors think that unless you have 500,000 or maybe even a million dollars or more to invest, you're actually more trouble than the time it takes to help you. I have a huge problem with that notion. You aren't a number, you're a person who has real financial goals, questions, and dreams. For those of you out there with less than a half million dollars to invest, have you found yourself stuck with a financial advisor who only tries selling you insurance or annuities, where it's obvious that you're nothing more than a commission to them? Or how about a robo-advisor that offers no personalized attention? Wouldn't you love to find someone who actually cares about your financial success? Someone who wants to know why you're investing in the first place? Well, I have good news. Ignite Investing now offers you personalized financial planning and advice, a professionally constructed portfolio, financial accountability, and a custom wealth plan so that you can make the most of your money, as well as connect you inside a community of investors who are goal-oriented like you and who are committed to achieving financial freedom. If that sounds like what you've been looking for, then we'd love for you to apply by visiting igniteinvesting.com and clicking on Get Started Today. Right. So you went from having a cushy six figure job where they probably bought you three meals a day or at least two to now are you self funded? Are you getting paid? Or how's the finances working? Yeah. <laughs> you hit it, Hillary. We would get, <laughs> we could spend 50 bucks a night for dinner. So like we were eating like, I mean, granted, when you're in the office at three in the morning, like a steak sometimes keeps you happy, but most of the time it's like, I just want to go home. Right. Um, a steak in styrofoam. <laughs> yeah, we got, you know, we got, we got good dinners and we did our dry cleaning and all right. that stuff. But, um, so yeah, and are we getting paid? So we've raised a little bit of money to like get us, get our product to market. You know, it's so different. Like you used to be able to raise venture funding, you know, from venture capitalists with like an idea on the back of a napkin. Now, not only do you need an idea and a business plan, you need a product you have to have developed the app, have it in market, and you need data that says people are using your product. So like, and that is step one before you can start to talk with real investors. So we had to develop our app. That took us a lot longer than we thought. It took us 13 months. Of course. Uh, now, now we have to get people using it. We've got a thousand people using it. And now we've got to get like more than people using it. And like, you got to get, you know, show that this is minimum viable product and proof of product market fit, which we don't really have yet. And then investors will start to talk to you. So that's a long roadmap. And so, yeah, we've been basically paying ourselves nothing to, to very, very, very little. And yeah, not eating steaks, not even in styrofoam. And, <laughs> and but you know, the, we're like, again, we're kind of at that tipping point where it's, we're very close to bringing in the next round of financing. And then we'll start to make salaries. I mean, not big salaries at all, nothing like what I used to make, but, you know, enough money to kind of get by and support us with the idea of what you were saying. We're swinging for the fences. So if the product works out and our execution works out, 
that those you know meager salaries will be trumped by us having equity and something that's worth a lot of money. Right. And that's the idea is to launch lean, to run it lean and to fund it so that it can scale. And then your big payoff is in theory, the exit is at the end when you either sell or go public. I imagine, is this an acquisition play? Yeah, it'll probably, I mean, who knows, but yeah, I, I, it would be great to get bought quicker than, than not because Hillary, like that, you're, you're right about the, the exit strategy, but for me, it's, it's, the, it's really the learning. That's what I'm most interested in here. I'm, my network is exploding of investors and startup guys. The startup ecosystem is so cool. This was why I was talking about how I didn't like the entertainment business before is because in the entertainment industry, if I did what I was good at and I emailed someone and I was like, hey, let's grab coffee. I'm interested in your career. People would respond back like, why would I get coffee with you? Like, what's in it for me? Why? Uh-huh. Uh, which is kind of, that's, I don't, I mean, maybe that's just not only the entertainment industry, but any kind of established industry, but the entertainment industry does have a lot of big ego people versus the startup world. The strength and the stability of the startup ecosystem is predicated on those that have had success sharing, helping, yeah, sharing, helping, getting involved, investing in the new and upcoming companies. That's what makes a strong startup ecosystem. And so in Los Angeles or Silicon Valley or wherever you are, you can find the great entrepreneurs and more likely than not, they're super willing to help you, advise you, invest in you when you're early on. And so that's so cool. I mean, we, we email now, we have conversations with the greatest entrepreneurs in the world and they're happy to help us and they give us hours and hours of their time it's super cool. Wow. So I'm learning so, so much. And, you know, I'm, I, we, we're first time entrepreneurs. I mean, I'm not a first time entrepreneur really, but I'm, I'm a first time entrepreneur going after venture financing. So it's, you can't expect us to keep all of the upside on this. And we have to give up equity to everyone. Like these advisors want equity, the investors want equity. So fine, we'll give them equity. And as long as I'm learning, that's how I view it is the next time on the next go around, I'll keep much, much more of the company and I'll have, it'll be much, much easier to raise money and I'll know how to do it. And that's what investors look for. Investors want to invest in second time on third time entrepreneurs. So that's, that's what it is. You know, it's like Warren Buffett says, as long as take the job that doesn't not, 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 don't take the job that pays you the most, take the job where you learn the most. Right. Because it's almost like you're just sort of climbing the wall as a first time out of the gates entrepreneur. It's not likely you're going to have a Zuckerberg experience. You're in your second MBA and then your third MBA and your fourth MBA and a failure is not a death, right? (laughs) It's all training ground. This goes to what I was saying about earlier about pleasing yourself versus impressing others. Impressing others, you want to have prestigious jobs and exits and lots of money that, that I don't, I, yes, I would like all those things, but I don't need them to be happy. I'm way more fulfilled in this job now than I ever was in any of my other prestigious jobs that paid me lots of money. I wake up motivated and happy and eager to go attack the day. And so, you know, at the end of the day, like that's, that's what's important for me. Perfect. So there's a couple of things I want to still talk with you about. First, I get a lot of questions from listeners of my show you know, I think the idea of getting funding from an outside party to start or run your business is very exciting. So can you talk a little bit about, and I realize this is a whole graduate level course, but you're, you so far, you seem really great at making things uncomplicated. Talk a little bit about who gets money from outside parties, what kinds of businesses, who gets angel funding, who gets venture funding, and how does that typically go? So if 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 I'm listening to this podcast, I can get a sense of, um, you know, oh, this is the company I'm thinking about starting. And based on what Alex says, I now know I, I'm a candidate for venture funding or I'm not. Sure. So Hillary, I, I laid out the business maturity of where you need to be to be talking with yes. sophisticated investors. So it's not an idea. It's not even a business plan. Yes, you need those things, but you need, they want, I mean, you can call them and they'll give you advice and they'll tell you the same thing, but you need to actually be working on something like developing something and fine. You say like, well, I want to open a flower shop. I need, you know, $250,000 to get the, the lease and to buy the inventory. 
fine, that's a little different. You put together a business plan and you make it good and you say what your economics are and how much money you need to do that and where you're going to do it. And if you lay out something very detailed like that, you can go raise money from people. You're not going to raise money from venture capitalists or because what venture capitalists are looking for is their business is predicated on finding a unicorn. They want to find the next Twitter or Apple or Uber uh, or next billion dollar valuation company because they have so many misses, so many companies that they invest in that go to zero, mm-hmm. that their return, their whole business, the whole venture capital business model is built upon finding these outsized type returns, these 100x, 200 time return companies that make up for all of those losers and pay you a very nice return. They're not looking for singles or doubles, back to your baseball, they're looking for home runs. Yeah. That's what that's what big time venture capitalists are looking for. So if you're going after a take over the world opportunity, like I say, yes, that's who you need to talk to. Even us, we're trying to get everybody to use this peer to peer payments app, but our initial market is college students, cl- uh, college fraternities and clubs, and and that's a three billion dollar market. And investors tell us that that's not big enough. They don't want a three billion dollar market. They want a three hundred billion dollar market. That, really. That you can, yeah, that you can go after and just get a small slice of it and, you know, then sell it to them, another company and like, that's it. That's simple. They want people, they want good founders operating in huge markets. That's what they're looking for. So fine, that's venture funding. Back to the flower shop example is that's going to be, you know, a couple million dollar business. Like, that's fantastic. You can support yourself off of that. You can make a really, really good living for your family and, and whatever off of that you're not going to get big time venture capitalists to invest in it. You can get angel investors in your area, wherever you are, you're in Chicago or Boston or something like there's going to be people who invest in businesses like that. And you can identify those people and you can go talk to them and get them their advice. And the way you do that is you say, Hey, Joe Schmo, I'd love to hear your advice. I have a startup and you're actually asking for money, but you don't ask for money. You ask for advice. Everyone wants to give advice. And then you go have a conversation with them and you get them excited about who you are and why you're the right person to go attack this opportunity and how you know more than anybody about flowers and how you've got some great lease that no one else even knows about. And it's like you create this urgency of why you, why right now and why they have to give you money. Um, And so that's just kind of a different return profile of people. And there are angel investors that get involved in these big time companies like Twitter and Uber and and they're just like the first checks into them. But angel investors run the gamut. There's angel investors that are looking for singles and doubles and triples and then the home runs. So you just got to f- be talking to the right audience. You have to talk to a lot of people. Tons. You hear no more than you hear yes. I mean, I, <laughs> Hillary, <laughs> I, 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 I've heard like, I'm not even going to say hundreds. It's, I've heard thousands of no's. Really? Um, when I ask people to be guests for the podcast and when I ask them to invest in our business or... I mean, whatever, you're going to hear lots and lots of notes. You have a thick skin. Yeah. And the other thing that you and I talked about that I think is fantastic is um, you have a thing you talk about called, you call it rejection therapy. So what's rejection therapy and why should my listeners be interested? Yeah, this is something I'm passionate about. (laughs) Uh, It's how you get that thick skin and not be afraid of no and not let that control what you do in your life and what you ask for. And because as kind of we've been talking about this entire podcast is you have to apply yourself and put yourself out there and ask for things because if you don't, like no one's going to on your behalf. So if you're not doing it, then you're not going to get it. So what rejection therapy is, is desensitizing yourself to the fear of rejection, which everybody in the world, every human being is afraid of being rejected. And so it's a similar concept to if you're afraid of germs. And every day you go touch something that's covered in germs. Like you go, you know, put your hands all over an escalator rail or something. <laughs> like over time, you're just going to become less and less afraid of germs. Like you're going to not get sick. You're going to realize you're still alive and you're fine. And you're going to be like, okay, like not that big a deal putting my hands on an escalator rail. Same thing of rejection is that like getting rejected sucks, it hurts, like no one wants it. So whether you're conscious of it or not, your brain is actively trying to protect you from not getting rejected. So what's the easiest way not to get rejected? Don't ask. Don't ask. 
yeah, and that doesn't work. You have to ask. So the easiest way to go start this process is you ask for very, very simple things. You ask someone for a stick of gum or a high five or, you know, take a picture or for a dollar. Like all these things, I mean, granted, they're hard. They're still hard to do. It's hard to ask someone for a stick of gum. Like you don't want to do that. But you do it and this rejection therapy, I mean, it takes, you can do it over a 30-day period and by day three, you're already seeing that it's becoming easier and easier to ask for things. Another easy thing is when you're, a, you know, buying your sandwich at lunch, you can say, hey, may I please have a discount on this sandwich? And so another thing actually happens is you start getting a lot of yeses. So you're looking for no, but you ask for a discount and they're like, yeah, sure, I can give you 10%. So I have so many cool yeses where I've got to go, you know, see where they cook the steaks at a restaurant or like, you know, I, I like food. So I'm like, constantly going into the kitchens of restaurants because I'm always asking for it. Or like, can I, <laughs> <laughs> can I have like an extra hamburger patty or something? And like people, <laughs> people do it. Like they, so you see that humans are really. Humans are wired to say yes, if they yeah, can. Like people want to help you. Like I got to, well, I went up and saw like the cockpit of an airplane and I like, you know, all these, all these things just because you asked. And so you're look, seeking for no, but you get a lot of yeses. Um, and so over time, not a not long time either, like over a couple of days asking for discounts and pieces of gum and stuff, all of a sudden you're not afraid to ask for anything. And so you can start to ask for like, money for your startup or promotions at work or, you know, for a customer to buy your product. Like it's just, it, you, you see, it doesn't matter. Like you see that a, everyone's so caught up in themselves that, like no one cares, you know, this is something for students in school, you know, before you ask a question in class, you've rehearsed the question five times in your head and you've thought, oh, people are people going to think I'm stupid for asking this? No one cares. Everyone is so caught up in thinking about themselves and thinking about their own questions that they're not like, oh, that was such a dumb question that Hillary just asked. She's stupid. <laughs> no, no. It's just this is not how it works. So you ask, you put yourself out there. You're looking for that no, but you get yes, you get humility, you get that people want to help you. It's kind of a cool little trick in life. I love it. And I want to reinforce what you said about people being obsessed with the questions that they ask. I went into my MBA program at Santa Clara University. I was 35 years old at the time. So that's the approximate. I mean, I was a little old for the, pro but it, it's, it's a part-time program. It's an evening program. So, you know, it's older. It's not average student is in their thirties, not their twenties. And I was with a cohort for nine months because we were in this accelerated sort of finish the program faster kind of a thing. And, um, so there were about 36 of us and no one would ask questions. No one would answer questions. No one would raise their hand or speak. It was so suppressive for me. I was like, what is wrong? We already know each other. We like each other. Can't we just, is it okay if I ask a dumb question? Is that all right? You know? <laughs> yeah. I don't want to have to strategize everything I say. Like this is my $72,000 MBA. I want to soak it up. <laughs> Yep, that's that's exactly right. That's how our brains are wired. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and um, this is actually something that I'm doing with. I have a wealth coaching program that I'm running right now. Ten women in a program called the 50k Wealth Multiplier Experience, and uh, one we're going to spend an entire month just asking for things. And it and rejection therapy is just another way to language. Go ask for that. Go ask for that. And one of the things that we know is that hum you're more likely to get a yes if you give someone a reason. So at Starbucks, may I please have a 15% discount is slightly less successful than may I have a 15% discount? It's my birthday or whatever. Don't lie. But, but, but <laughs> give them a reason to ask. So when you, when you go about your rejection therapy, do you give yourself goals? Do you try to get a certain number of no's at, per day? Yeah. I mean, the real rejection therapy is you want to get rejected every day. So you just <laughs> got to do it. You just got to do it once. You got to like muster up the nerve to go ask someone for something one time. And if you get a yes, then you got, you still got to get that. You still got to get that no. Uh, and you're right. It's totally easier if you humanize it. And instead of just asking like a robot, may I please have a discount on this? You say like, Hey, can I have the good guy discount? Oh, what's the good guy discount? <laughs> I'm a it's good like, guy. You know, I'm a good guy. You're a good guy. Like, can I get a discount? Like, 
you're, you're, you're right. You're way more likely to get yes on that. So I never use it because I don't want, I don't want to do, I, I'm looking for the no. Oh, <laughs> wow. You really are intense. All right, good. So a no every day. Maybe that's the, the title of this episode. Why getting, yeah. why hearing no every day could pi- quite possibly make you a millionaire? Maybe. I mean, I, I hear no dozens of times per day. And the other, the other thing about, about it is, is, well, for me, is I love getting no because, yeah, it kind of like fulfills that for me. But then I get to think creatively about how to get a yes. And so like the no is just the beginning. Someone says, no, I don't want to come on your podcast. It's like, well, how can I, you know, get you to yes? And right. the, then you can like if that's when you use your wits and your smarts and your creativeness, what I was talking about, I'm really creative and you, you can get people over the line. So the no is just the beginning. I like how you've turned, uh, getting a no, which for so many people is like a devastating experience into something really empowering. I feel like we should wrap up there, but is there anything I haven't asked about anything else you'd like to put in today? No, this was so much fun talking with you, Hillary. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing your life and for talking to us about rejection therapy. Cool. Today's episode of Profit Boss Radio was brought to you by Ignite Investing. If it's time to release all that financial anxiety and make sure you're on the right path to financial success by hiring a comprehensive wealth management team and you have between $25,000 and $499,000 to invest, go to igniteinvesting.com now and click Get Started today. For today's show notes, visit hillaryhendershot.com. And if you love Profit Boss Radio, please share the show with your friends. And of course, leave us a five-star review on iTunes. Until next time, I wish you much prosperity. Prosperity.